وإني على ثقة من طريق إلى الله رب السنا والشروق فإن عافني السوق أو عاقني فإني أمين لعهد الوثيق فإني أمين لعهد الوثيق الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين One of the most disastrous and dangerous events in the history of Islam was the fall of the Islamic Caliphate. This event was not a sudden event, but rather it took two centuries of continuous work by the enemies of Islam for it to occur. In his book titled Islam in the world, the rise and decline of the Muslims and the effect on mankind by Abu al-Hasan al-Nadawi, he discusses this fall, quote, Although we can find many examples of nations and communities that have disappeared or have been conquered, the disintegration of the Muslims, their isolation, and their failure to remain as the leaders of the world was not the kind of loss that has ever happened in the history of the nations and empires that existed before. Due to the gradual nature of the disintegration, the world did not truly understand what it had lost, and people could not imagine the difficulties that they would have to suffer ever since. This painful event shook some Muslim individuals into working towards reviving the Islamic Caliphate. Some of these efforts were calling the people to return to Islam using the Quran as their sole source of guidance. However, the Islamic movements after the fall of the Caliphate did not assess the reality of today correctly. Therefore, they follow a wrong methodology. In contrast, Sayyid Qutb studied the Qur'an and compared it to the reality of today. This made him to reach the right assessment and follow the right methodology, which made him stand out from the other scholars. Qutb understood that the deviation cannot be solved through partial or superficial solutions. Instead, the deviation is from the fact that the people are in jahiliyyah. In his famous commentary to the Qur'an, in the shade of the Qur'an, Sayyid Qutb writes, We are today in a situation similar to that which prevailed when the religion of Islam first declared to mankind that there is no deity except Allah. Human beings have reverted to the worship of other creatures and accepted the oppression of different forms of religion and abandoned the principle of Allah's oneness, His absolute authority, supremacy, and sovereignty in its true sense. It is true that some groups of people still make the declaration on minarets that there is no deity except Allah, but they hardly know its true sense, and as such, they do not mean it. Nor do they reject the claims of others to sovereignty, which is synonymous uh, with the absolute divinity of Allah. It does not matter whether individuals, legislative, consuls, or nations claim the authority over people, for none of these is a deity to exercise that authority. It is only the relapse of humanity into jahiliyyah, that assigns to such creatures the attributes of divinity. As such, humanity no longer manifests a firm belief in Allah's absolute authority, supremacy, and sovereignty, or total devotion to Him alone. This applies to all mankind, including those everywhere in the world, who repeat the declaration of Allah's divinity from minarets without giving it its true meaning or putting it into practice. These incur a bigger sin, one which is more severely punishable on the Day of Judgment because they have sunk back into the worship of creatures after they have received proper guidance and embraced the true faith. Commentary to Surah Al-An'am, page 72. <laughs> Qutb's approach led him to believe that the starting point for any Muslim group that wanted to re-establish Islam as a complete way of life is for them to understand and be certain of the fact that 
all societies in the world today are living in jahiliyyah and that an Islamic society does not exist anymore. He says, quote, Moreover, the Muslim community which strives to re-establish this religion in daily life must be fully and clearly aware of this fact. They must also make it decisively clear to all people. This is the starting point. If an Islamic movement deviates from this fact at any moment, it is bound to go astray and build its efforts on weak foundations, even though it may have abundance of sincerity, perseverance, and determination to fulfill its duties. Therefore, Qutb strongly believe that the starting point for the reestablishment of Islam is calling humanity once again to the system of life as represented by there is no deity except Allah. Qutb writes in his book, It must be clear to the advocates of Islam that when they call for Islamic revival, they are actually calling on people to adopt the Islamic faith, even though they may claim to be Muslims and have birth certificates to support this claim. People should be made to understand that Islam means, in the first place, to believe fully and completely that there is no deity except Allah. The practical import of this belief is to acknowledge that sovereignty and authority over all human affairs belongs to Allah alone, and a rejection of those who claim such authority for themselves. In this way, the belief in Allah's oneness, His absolute authority, supremacy, and sovereignty is firmly established in their hearts and manifested in their worship and daily practices. To re-emphasize, when trying to re-establish the Islamic religion, it should be the understanding of those who are striving to deliver Allah's message that they must call people to embrace Islam from the very beginning even though the people may call themselves Muslims. They must first let them know that Islam is acknowledging and fully understanding that there is no deity but Allah, and all that it entails among themselves and in their reality. Qutb was also certain that the only way leading to an Islamic society is by forming or establishing an Islamic group. In his book, Islam and the Problems of Civilization, Qutb emphasizes this, saying, the only way that will lead to the re-establishment of Islam is to form an Islamic group which has members. This group should then start the long and difficult journey that was taken by their predecessors, led by the last messenger of Allah, Muhammad, peace be upon him. Elsewhere in the same book he says, today people do not seriously respond to what they read or hear. Instead, what makes them react or change is to see a group of people who have accepted Islam as divine guidance and comprehensively applies this to their daily activities. Qutb not only discussed his ideas with the Muslim Brotherhood, but he wrote them in books for people all around the world. Among the most notable of these books are In the Shade of the Quran and The Milestones. While in prison, Qutb met with many members of the Muslim Brotherhood and explained his ideas of how the world today has reverted to a complete state of jahiliyyah and what is required of those who seek to re-establish Islam once again. Indeed, Allah is with those who strive to re-establish Islam as he says in the Quran, وَعَدَ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مِنْكُمْ وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ لَيَسْتَخْلِفَنَّهُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ كَمَا اسْتَخْلَفَ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِمْ وَلَيُمَكِّنَنَّ لَهُمْ دِينَهُمْ الَّذِي ارْتَضَى لَهُمْ وَلَيُبَدِّلَنَّهُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ خَوْفِهِمْ أَمْنًا يَعْبُدُونَنِي لَا يُشْرِكُونَ بِي شَيْئًا صَدَقَ Allah has promised those of you who believe and do good works 
to make them masters in the land, as he had made their ancestors before them masters in the land, and that he will surely establish for them their religion as he chose for them, and will give them security instead of their fear. They will serve me and will associate nothing with me. As we know, there is a difference between reading a letter from your teacher and asking him questions directly face to face. Similarly, we have seen the effect of Qutb's writing around the world and how much impact they have. So, how about those who met him personally and directly asking him questions day in and day out? One of those who were fortunate to meet him is Sheikh Mustafa Kamil Muhammad, who is the current leader of the group, the Proclaimers of the Truth, and the author of the book, The Shuruh, Commentaries and Explanations of Sayyid Qutb's Milestones. Sheikh Mustafa, in his biography titled My Story with Sayyid Qutb, talked about his past membership with Muslim Brotherhood and how he met Sayyid Qutb. Sheikh Mustafa understood from Sayyid Qutb the necessity of humanity to reconnect with Allah. It is impossible for a Muslim who understood this remarkable truth to fail his duty of calling people to Islam once again. As a result, Sheikh Mustafa decided to explain and comment on Qutb's book, The Milestones, which the enemies of Islam have called the Manifesto of Muslim Movements. Sheikh Mustafa's explanation and commentary on the milestones is not like any other Islamic book. Some of the points that make this book stand out. First, as a student of uh, Qutb, Sheikh Mustafa had the opportunity to spend time and directly learn from the author of the milestones. He had the opportunity to ask questions when issues were not clear. He had the opportunity to consult with Qutb on ways to overcome the inevitable obstacles that will be faced by the Muslim group throughout their uh, long journey. As a result, Sheikh Mustafa is the most suitable person to finally express the aims and mission on how to reestablish Islam in the hearts of the people. Second, to put into practice what he had learned from his mentor, Sheikh Mustafa founded a group that later assumed the name of Sadiq ibn al-Haq, the proclaimers of the truth. The group aims to bring back Islamic Caliphate. This provided him the opportunity to apply what he, what he had learned from his mentor. Thus, this commentary came after a long and fruitful experiences within an Islamic movement that he had established and nourished with his heart, mind, and soul. Third, he started to educate the group socially and ideologically. The opportunity of being a leader of a real life movement has given Sheikh Mustafa the necessary experience that helped him explain and expand the milestones. Fourth, educating and training this group took more than four decades. During that time, he worked closely with the members of the group and learned their personality and dealt with their issues. At the same time, he put emphasis on being a good role model in all aspects of life, including style and clothing. Throughout the book, you could see this focus on educating and elevating the human spirit, which is rarely found in other works. Fifth. Sheikh Mustafa paid great attention in educating members of his group regarding the characteristics of the battle between Islam, the only acceptable religion of Allah, and all the other wrong ideologies and distorted religions. If you read this commentary, you will see how much effort he put into educating members of the group regarding what is happening around them. Among the topics that were discussed include the cynical and destructive plans of the enemies of Allah and the tricks they employed to appease the ordinary people in concentrating on superficialities such as building mosques, praying five times a day, and the outwardly appearance of the Muslim rather than his substance. Sheikh Mustafa has also exposed how the enemies of Allah have been working tirelessly to tame 
some Muslim movements and forcing them to make compromises while dealing harshly with any other movement that it senses is striving to bring back the real Islamic society and the Islamic caliphate. As a result, people have become fearful for their own lives and there are many scholars who have opted to become silent with the false excuse that silence with belief in the heart is still faith. Whereas there are others who have chosen to become strategic with their actions and said that the benefits outweigh the risks in working with the enemies of Allah. <laughs> Sheikh Mustafa used the shuroh to guide members of the group over many years of educating and overcoming obstacles. The shuroh is the result of the author's many experiences, including Qutub's mentorship, emotions from many years of contemplating on the Quran, the truth of the divinity of Allah, as well as challenges of choosing dedicated people and calling them to Islam. Before we end, we will provide examples that show how the commentary dealt with the topics discussed by the milestones. Since Sheikh Mustafa was taught by Qutb and lived with the milestones, he deeply understood the methodology described by Qutb. That deep understanding allow him to form an Islamic group that would become pioneers of the Islamic revival and for whom the milestones was actually written. Qutub wrote in the introduction to the milestones, it is imperative for the group who decide to establish Islam afresh to have milestones. These milestones will teach them the characteristics of, the ro of their role the real job that is awaiting from them and the goals they are striving to achieve in the long run. These milestones will help them understand where to start their long journey, the nature of their stance towards, towards Jahiliyyah that has spread all over the earth and what type of relationships they will have within the society they live, want to cooperate with others and want to separate from them. These milestones will also help Islamic advocates understand what are their characteristics and what are the characteristics of the Jahiliyyah surrounding them, how they will address Jahiliyyah with the language of Islam, and what issues they will present. In addition, they will clearly know their source of determining all of these milestones and the manners of approaching this source of guidance. <laughs> It is very important that these milestones are firmly established on the Quran as this is the ultimate source of the Islamic creed. It is also important to understand how the Quran guided the first generation that Allah chose for this religion and how they transformed the history of the world we live in. Let us look at how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed the author of the commentary the student of Sayyid Qutb to clarify in detail what Qutb had uh, written phrase by phrase. The first important milestone is to recognize the characteristics of the Muslim group's role or the nature of the duty which is leadership. That is leading mankind to Allah and to his guidance. They must realize that they have inherited an enormous and critical task so they never lessen nor diminish from the nature of their role nor themselves. They must be full of confidence and comprehend the immensity of their job. The second milestone is understanding the real job that is waiting for them, which is to communicate Allah's message and to guide mankind to this truth. This is their duty, and this is the most glorious duty a person can fulfill. It had been the duty of all the messengers of Allah. May peace be upon them all. The third milestone is to be aware of the goal which is to be a devoted servant of Allah. The fourth is to be aware of where to start their long journey, the starting point of delivering the message, which is to begin with the core fundamental beliefs of Islam, summarized by the great truth and testimony, there is no deity except Allah. The fifth, 
is the nature of their stance towards Jahiliya that has spread all over the earth, which is to clearly identify their possession towards Jahiliya, being isolated and distinguished from Jahiliya. The sixth is to recognize what type of relationship they will have within the society they live. Where will they meet and where do they separate from others? Which is practically understanding where to cross paths with people and where to separate. Hence the issue of loyalty and enmity. The vanguard must be aware of how to deal and cooperate with people and want to depart and the basis by which this is determined. The seventh is to be aware of their characteristics and the characteristics of the jahiliyyah surrounding them. This can also be described as recognizing the current reality. It is imperative for the vanguard to know the current reality very well, to know their own characteristics, then to know the characteristics of jahiliyyah surrounding them in order to determine the distance between themselves and the jahiliyyah, and also to determine the starting point in dealing with jahiliyyah. The eighth is to recognize how they will address Jahiliyyah with the language of Islam and what issues they will present. This is essentially the methodology of the Islamic movement. We have to be keenly mindful of methodology when addressing the Jahiliyyah. Not every speech and communication is proper, and not every starting point and engagement is correct. Similarly, we cannot condone any and all methods to address Jahiliyyah. Application of the appropriate methodology is what distinguishes between many of the Islamic movements. The ninth is that they will clearly know their source for determining all of these milestones, and that these milestones are firmly established on the Qur'an, as this is the ultimate source of the Islamic creed. This is the highly important issue of being aware of where and how we receive guidance, determining the source that will establish the truth and guide us to the proper methodology is a very important matter. Lastly, the tenth is the manner of approaching the source of guidance and how the Qur'an guided the first generation that Allah chose for this religion and how they transformed the history of the world. This is to be aware of how and with what spirit Islam was initially established by the first shining group, the chosen group, the companions of the Messenger of Allah. Allah indeed used them to establish Islam as He willed. The companions are the perfect example that we should be following when applying the fundamentals of Islam. We have to see how they developed themselves and how they established Islam as a living reality. We see how Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, transformed from Umar the rigid, violent, arrogant, to the guided, scholar, leader, and merciful of a uh, servant of Allah. How did this transformation take place? How did Khalid bin al-Walid, may Allah be pleased with him, transform from being an enemy of Islam to Allah's drawn sword, struggling for the sake of Islam? These examples clearly show the character of this commentary and the author's style in deeply explaining the eight topics outlined in the milestones. The title of the book is Shuruh, Commentaries and Explanations of Sayyid Qutb's Milestones. وَإِنِّي عَلَى ثِيقَةٍ مِّن طَرِيقِ إِلَى اللَّهِ رَبِّ السَّنَا وَالشُّرُوقِ فَإِنْ عَافَنِ السَّوْقُ أَوْ عَاقَنِي فَإِنِّي أَمِينٌ لِعَهْدِ الْوَثِيقِ فَإِنِّي أَمِينٌ لِعَهْدِ الْوَثِيقِ